things. I, I think I know most everybody in the room, but if you don't, uh, my name is Peter Van Alphen. I am a curator here and um, uh, been working uh, for quite a while now on uh, some of our uh, digital projects, which I'll, I'll discuss here. Uh, also, uh, for those of you who have computers or devices, um, we do have a, a free wireless or Wi-Fi uh, here um, that you can log into and then follow along, you know, on your computer if you'd like. Um, you know, for um, a little bit later on, I'll demo some of this stuff as well. Now, let me just find my presentation here. All right, so I, I want to talk about a couple of things. Um, first, the first part is putting the ANS collection online, uh, FileMaker to Mantis, and uh, David already gave you a little bit of the history of, of how this came on, uh, but this is something that we are constantly um, uh, revamping and constantly tweaking with to make it um, better overall. And then secondly, I want to talk about uh, these various online digital resources that we have been developing over the course of the last decade or so. So the latest iteration of our Mantis or uh, collection search um, uh, presents it, uh, you know, first like this, where you can click on the individual departments, eleven individual departments, to um, try to find what it is that you're looking for. And at the moment, we have about six hundred and ten thousand objects in the collection database now. This doesn't represent everything we have in the collection, partly because uh, over the course of the last 160 years, the collection has grown you know, organically, and there have been different approaches to cataloging the collection. Obviously, for the first number of generations, this was all done by hand in big paper record books and so forth. And um, when uh, George Kuhay started to catalog the material and subsequent curators um, participated in this as well, they were able to you know, make tremendous inroads into the digital catalog, which has become the definitive catalog of the collection, but we are still uh, discovering pockets of unaccessioned material. And so um, we do not yet have a total count of everything that we have in the collection. We have sort of an, a rough idea but um, you know, at the moment, uh, this uh, Mantis uh, database only represents a proportion, a fairly large proportion, obviously, but only a proportion of what we actually have in the collection. Now, um, once you click on one of the departments, and here I just show the Greek department, you're then presented with a number of drop-down tabs, <coughs> region, mint, uh, dynasty, authority, and so forth, in order to help you find what it is that you're looking for in the collection, and I'll give you a demonstration of this a little bit later. Now, part of the problem, however, and I'm sure that any of you who have worked with our database uh, or played around with Mantis online a little bit have noticed that you're not always finding what it is that you're looking for. And a great deal of the reason why has to do with just the quality of the data that lies behind Mantis. And this is um, something that lies within our internal f um, database um, program, which uh, is, is based on FileMaker at the moment. And here you can see um, a screenshot of what, you know, what it is we work with internally here and then the way that that's translated into uh, the interface on, on Mantis. Now, <clears throat> part of the problem here uh, with the data quality, um, you know, simply has to do with the fact that over the last 35, 40 years, there have been a good number of people who have been involved in um, entering data into uh, uh, the FileMaker or earlier iterations of, of the database. And, um, you know, in some cases, uh, there there was, uh, you know, greater efforts um, to complete the records, you know, in its entirety. Um, in some instances, you know, not so much. And so here, for example, um, here's a very basic record of a bronze coin from Ephesus, for example, and we can compare that with a much more complete record for a coin, for, you know, a Seleucid coin. And you can see, you know, how, you know, the fields here are, you know, more filled out in terms of references, in terms of the denomination, the dates, um, the basic uh, um, descriptive categories, and so forth. You know, and here again, see that in this case, there's not no photograph even. So um, 
th this isn't actually to disparage in any way the, the work of the earlier curators and volunteers and George Kuhay in any way. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of the way that this data was, was entered in earlier generations, you know, really had to do with, you know, prioritization of what needed to be done. And in George's case, certainly, you know, the, the goal was just to get as much of this stuff entered as possible in its most basic way. But um, our priorities have changed, and right now our priority really is to try to make this um, database as complete as possible and also to standardize this as much as possible because one of the other inherent problems is that over the course of the last many um, decades, there has been um, not a tremendous concern with standardizing the way that these coins were described. Um, in fact, in almost all of these fields from, say, material manufacture, um, even the way that these individual fields were used, um, there, there has been a, a complete, well, not, not complete, but a, a great deal um, uh, uh, lack of standardization in that. And so one of the concerns that we have right now is trying to go through each and every one of these fields and each and every department to try to standardize this as much as we possibly can in order to facilitate the searches so that when you go into Mantis and click on one of those drop down tabs, you'll be able to find everything that you're looking for because all of the data lying behind it has been you know, standardized. And here, um, you're, you won't be able to see what each one of these uh, fields here reads, but you can see that um, when you compare it with this slide, um, there's a great deal more standardization for these um, Alexander III types from Sardis than there is for this run of Athenian owls. Um, so clearly, I've got a great deal more work to do on the Athenian owls to you know, make this as you know, um, standardized as possible. Now. One of the problems that we have with standardizing each and every one of these fields is that um, we need to first decide on what uh, some of these terms are and, and come up with a definitive list and a definitive definition of many of, the, of these terms. And this has meant that for a number of years now, we have ha been having regular, almost weekly curatorial meetings to sit down around this table to discuss things like materials. So what are the materials um, that we are faced with and how do we then standardize the terms for these materials? And this starts typically with a l big printout of all of the materials and all of the departments that are currently in the database. And um, sometimes, you know, this, this is a sheet that can run on for pages and pages and pages and you find just completely odd things, you know, say parked in that materials field. So we then have to go through that long list and figure out, um, you know, what materials are actually there and in terms of things like copper-based alloys, what types of terms we're going to allow and then standardize for this database. And this, you know, as you can imagine, can be a, a rather arduous process. So going through just the materials alone took weeks and weeks of, you know, meetings around the table and everybody looking at their individual departments and trying to figure out what, you know, the standardized terms for, you know, the various copper alloys, for example, should be. And this is um, where we are at the moment, for example, with materials. Um, this is a shared Google spreadsheet um, where we have, you know, set up a list of um, uh, primary materials here, say copper, and then a subtype, copper alloys, and then uh, the sub-subtype, you know, with the various types of copper alloys right there. So even though once we, we have these terms um, that we've decided upon, the next step then is to try to find a way to reference these to some sort of stable thesaurus or reference, you know, outside of, um, you know, our own uh, deliberations around this table. And this is where Nomisma ID comes into play, and I'll, you know, talk a little bit more about that in a moment. This is something that uh, David already introduced. And you can see that, you know, in addition to creating um, or referencing a Nomisma ID, we are also then trying to find other um, links to other um, databases or thesauri outside, such as the Getty or the BM thesaurus as well, too, so that we can, again, start to link up, you know, some of these terms or concepts to stabilize them as much as possible. Um, and so for every one of these fields, essentially, especially for the major descriptive fields, such as material shape, um, you know, mints, and so forth, era, 
and onward, we we do need to stabilize and define these concepts. And here, you know, is is a partial view of the Greek mints, for example. And this, um, you know, has been worked through and is at the moment fairly well complete. You know, so um, in this case, we decided to use head, you know, Barclay's head Histor Numorum from 1911 as the primary reference and using then um, the Latinate spellings for these mints rather than Greek versions, you know, say colophon with a C rather than with a K, um, you know, which is, um, you know, what head had used. And so, you know, we point to head, but then we use head, you know, to um, set up these nomisma IDs um, and, and then to create these um, definitions essentially for that. So we are in the process right now then of going through each and every one of these fields in the database in order to you know, define these concepts, um, you know, say in terms of material shape and so forth. But then we are also running into problems as well too with the way that this database was originally set up. And at the moment, one of the um, problems that we're having is how to represent the various places associated with numismatic material. And at the moment we have three, uh, or essentially four fields. One is region, subregion, locality, and mint. But as we begin to work through a lot of this material, say um, scripts um, from the 19th century in the US or you know abroad, these four fields do not cover every possible um, representation of, of um, locality or geographical location that um, you know is inherent in this material. And so this is a, a problem that we're working through at the moment. And in, in my colleague David Yoon has come up with a working document or working paper um, to discuss some of the issues that we're having. Say, you know, um, you know, this concept of mint, what is a mint actually, you know, and how does that relate to, say, the place of authority or a stated authority? You know, in the case of, say, posthumous Alexander, the, or the posthumous coinage of Alexander the Third, you have an inscription, you know, on the coin that says Alexandru, coin of Alexander, but you know full well when this coin was minted 100 years after Alexander died that he was not the authority or um, that this coin was not minted in Macedonia where he was from originally, although you will often find these coins listed under Macedonia, you know, even posthumous issues of Alexander. So you, you begin to get a sense of how complicated this is and how, you know, at the moment we're, we're trying to um, solve or resolve some of these, these problems and perhaps create new fields that will capture some of this, but then have to do this in a systematic way that, you know, we can, you know, work on and define as well. Um, so the, the place where we ultimately then park all of these decisions is nomisma, and this has become a, a key um, uh, thesaurus uh, for um, numismatic concepts, and you know, this is something that um, Sebastian Heath and Andy Meadows uh, developed almost a decade ago, and this now is controlled by a group, a um, international steering committee, essentially. And so, you know, once we have um, worked out in a spreadsheet, for example, the I, the concepts that we have, or say the the materials, then you know we present this to the committee, and then we start, you know, once, once it gets the okay, essentially, then we start um, minting, as it were, uh, nomisma IDs um, for each one of these concepts. And essentially, you know, what that is then is is a, um, a page that looks something like this, where you have, in this case, material electrum, which is defined, uh, or legend, a you know, so this is a material, this is a numismatic term or concept, legend here, and then this is a mint, you know, Athens, and each one of these then has its own dedicated web page with a stable URI, you know, the address that you see in the, uh, in the bar at the top, and that, um, stable URI is critical then, the critical key as it were for then, you know, linking all of this stuff together, which I'll, I'll show you in just a moment. Is this going to ISO? <coughs> I'm sorry? Is this going to ISO for standardization? Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, uh, you know, the way that, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't answer that question, sorry. But, uh, so, because most of the work that has been done to date and most of the people involved in Nomisma to date have been primarily working on the ancient world of, you know, Nomisma at the moment is, is fairly good for Greek and uh, Roman coinage, but it's, it's not so good for later periods. And this is something that um, we're trying to address at the moment. 
uh, by forming you know various subcommittees and so forth to try to you know knock out terms and places and and so forth for say medieval coinage and then you know Latin American coinage and um, you know contemporary coinage and so forth, and this is you know key obviously for what we're doing internally here at the ANS in order to standardize our own database. You know we need to get you know a lot of these nomisma IDs um, you know for other collections or other departments in our in our uh, um, curatorial department overall, you know, settled, resolved, so that we can deal with our own <laughs> database and present it in a um, much more coherent and standardized fashion. So that is essentially what we're doing internally with the database um, to, you know, try to make Mantis a much more, um, you know, easy to use tool and much more um, comprehensive tool, um, you know, at least for accessing, you know, what we have internally. But at the same time, we're involved with a number of projects um, to try to link together as many collections and other resources as possible to create, you know, really um, you know, amazing avant-garde, you know, numismatic research tools. So. Um, most of these tools um, you can find right now on our online resources page on our website. So if you go to no, uh, numismatics.org slash resources, you'll find a list of what we have currently available. Um, and a, a good number of these at the moment are focused on the Roman world, um, in part because we have received um, uh, some major NEH support for Ochre, the online coins of the Roman Empire. Uh, this, this was a project that was started um, by Andy Meadows and others about four years ago, and we received a major NEH grant for three years to support that project. And that grant um, ended earlier this year in the spring, and you know, happy to report that we ticked off all of the boxes um, for that project, and, and even then <coughs> some. So this, um, this is a major um, online tool. Um, uh, we, we also launched uh, Coinage of the Roman Republic online, uh, so we've got you know, the Republic through the Empire more or less covered with that. And then, in addition, um, have uh, a, uh, a tool that allows you to um, search for um, coin hordes of the Roman Republic and, and uh, so forth. Now, um, I, I was feeling that the Greek side wasn't quite as well represented you know, in all of this, and so um, a few years ago I thought it would be a good idea to get rolling on the Greek side, and, and since we have a tremendous number of coins in the name of Alexander in the collection, in fact, in our, our Greek collection is you know, roughly 100,000 coins, and about 15,000 of those, or 15%, are coins in the name of Alexander. And this you know, was, was a major interest of previous curators, starting with um, Edward Newell and so forth. And so this was an obvious place to start, to um, create a, um, an online uh, project there. And so we launched Pella in 2014 as a way to try to capture all of this and present it in a way. So, um, and then much more recently, this year, we received uh, NEH funding to uh, expand Pella, but then also to um, uh, add a number of other sites uh, devoted to Seleucid coinage and Ptolemaic coinage under this larger umbrella of, of a site that we're going to call the Hellenistic Royal Coinages um, in a project or site. And you can read you know, you know, about what all of this is on our blog, a blog post from uh, earlier this year in March. Um, but what I want to talk about actually is how these resources are built and what they do. So uh, the first step obviously is um, just stabilizing the concepts and this is something that you know David talked a little bit about um, um, finding ways to link you know the various components of all of this together and this LOD this is linked open data for numismatic local area microcomputer integration. So basically it's just a way of trying to get, you know, all of these various individual projects, um, you know, around the digital worlds and around the world um, physically, you know, all linked up. And there are, for the ancient world at the moment, a good number of digital initiatives that are uh, based on linked open data concepts, um, you know, one of which, you know, for example, is Pleiades, um, you know, a massive database of various things ancient, including um, site mapping and um, uh, other um, content. Um, there, there's also um, sites devoted to texts um, such as Perseus and, and so forth. And so 
in order for us to participate in all of this and link in a lot of this other information that's out there, which is potentially very useful, if not critical, for what we're doing, you know, we need to be, you know, up working within these um, linked open data standards. And so, um, you know, we are, you know, very much a um, major player in, you know, developing these standards as well as participating, you know, in linked open data. And um, you've already seen this slide yeah. <laughs> of, of the way that this works. Um, and as you saw this slide partially, you know, with Ethan in the foreground. But, you know, here again, you know, a lot of what we do, say, in terms of the individual items within the collection, as well as the typology, which I'll talk about in a moment with Pella and hoard information, all of this then gets routed, in a sense, through Nomisma, through um, standardized URIs and concepts and so forth. So, you know, Nomisma serves essentially as a node, a way of bringing all of this stuff together and, and then, you know, pushing it into um, other formats as well. So, you know, the first place then, you know, again, is just standardizing and defining, you know, the numismatic terms, places, concepts, and so forth behind what it is that we're doing, you know, and some of this obviously is going on internally with uh, individual items within the collection, but then you have to step back as well and do it for um, larger things such as typologies. Um, you know, and here, here again is just a, a, an example of a Nomisma page, this one devoted to Augustus, and you can see, you know, among the various things that this page does is is offer um, translations of Augustus into, I think right now we have about 130 different languages. And this um, can be very useful, in fact, for then um, ultimately allowing sites like Ochre or Pella or so forth to switch between languages. You know, at the moment, if you go into Ochre, you have a choice, I think, of at least a dozen different languages that you can switch between. So if you are an Arabic speaker, for example, and you don't, you're not particularly comfortable in, in English, you can go and you can go to the language dropdown, switch to Arabic, and all Every, everything in that site then will switch to Arabic or French or German or Spanish or you know what have you and and part of that is again based on um, these sort of definitions and the translations of these definitions into uh, multiple languages so a lot of the um, sites that were building these resources, such as Ochre and Pella and uh, Coinage of the Roman Republic Online, are essentially typological catalogs. And this is something that you know, most of you are familiar with from your work in numismatics, where scholars have gone through an array of coinage and have developed types or um, series of the coins and have then presented them. And in this case, with um, Pella, we based uh, that Pella is based um, at the moment on this magnificent work of Martin Jessup Price, um, you know, his magnum opus that was published in 1991, uh, coinage in the name of Alexander the Great and Philip Aradeus. Now, this um, in in this work, Price identified roughly 4,000 different types of Alexander coinage, based you know primarily on you know obverse reverse distinctions where the um, inscription was located, and then of course the various monograms and other symbols that appear on the coins. But overall, um, there are 4,000 plus types that um, Price identified, and of course. Our collection, as well as the British Museum collection and the collection of Berlin and so forth, have been using price types or price numbers to organize their material, you know, for a generation now since this um, book was published. And so this would be an obvious place to start, um, you know, with all that. So the first step then is to essentially create a digital version of um, price. And um, this essentially required me and Andy Meadows to sit down, you know, evening after evening. You know, we, we divided price in half. He took, you know, one through 2,000 something, and I took 2,000 through 4,000 and, and, you know, would watch TV while I was entering all of this data, which, you know, essentially, you know, which probably explains why there's a few typos, <laughs> so, which we'll, we'll take care of. But, um, it essentially then just required creating a spreadsheet, you know, that you see here that included, you know, the price number, the dates that price has in there, the authority and so forth. And there, there are, you know, I think, 20-something different fields that we were entering, you know, for that. But once the spreadsheet is finished, this is what Ethan can then use to create the typological page for each and every one of those um, 
of um, price pages in Pella. And so if you click on price four, uh, for example, in Pella, it pulls up a typological description that you see right here, which is based on that spreadsheet, which is based on price. Now, um, one of the things you will notice, uh, each one of these little um, blue arrows right there, that if you click on that, that takes you to Nomisma, to the Nomisma page for, um, say, the, the numismatic concept of coin or struck or tetradram or silver and so forth. So each of these concepts here then has been, you know, or concepts or materials or so forth, has been defined you know, within uh, Nomisma and standardized there. Um, so once we have the typological description you know, set up for price four, the next step then is to start um, linking um, material into that page. And this is then where we uh, begin to pull material from our own collection, you know, the ANS. And this requires that we go into our database and start to um, uh, regularize, or, you know, again, standardize all of the individual coin entries and assign uh, uh, price numbers to those records and so forth, like I showed you a little bit earlier, the, how that nice Sardis sheet, you know, is looking, you know, quite nicely standardized simply because I went in and standardized all of that in order for it to be pulled into Pella. Um, so at, at the moment, actually this, um, this is a little bit outdated. I, I checked this morning and we have roughly 19,000 coins um, uh, currently, or uh, over 19,000 coins that are um, linked into Pella from 13 different contributors. And we have over um, 109,000 coins linked into Ochre from 16 different contributors. So um, what we are doing here at the ANS, um, other institutes are doing um, overseas and France and in Germany and, and elsewhere uh, to um, create um, digital versions of their catalogs that then can be linked up with sites like Pella. And this, you know, essentially um, requires that they, you know, again, participate in these linked open uh, data protocols and set up their data in such a way that, you know, it can be grabbed by, you know, something like, like Pella. So, um, the cool thing then is, you know, so we, we have our own individual page for, you know, say a coin, in this case 1944.100.12991. This was a coin donated by Edward Newell, uh, you know, which um, has a description of that individual object. Um, there are similar type pages um, in Berlin, you know, the uh, the Münz cabinet in, in Berlin, where they've you know created their own online catalog and so forth. But these two individual catalogs, um, in this case, uh, these two individual coins, which are price four types, then can be sucked into um, of this price four uh, page on um, on Pella. So what I showed you, the typological description sits at the top of the page, and then if you scroll down, you begin to see all the various price four examples that have been brought into that page from uh, various collections. And in this case, there are uh, currently a, about 60 examples of price four from um, five different collections uh, worldwide. And so, you know, if you are a numismatic researcher, you know, this, you know, obviously creates, um, you know, a, a wonderful opportunity for you to be able to see material in a number of different collections, um, you know, just, you know, with a few clicks of the button, you know, rather than having to scroll, you know, through the internet trying to find, you know, this, this material um, individually. And, you know, obviously the goal ultimately is to try to get as many collections linked up as possible. In fact, um, ultimately we hope, you know, coin archives as well too, or, you know, other repositories of this type of information. So when you go to a, a page like this, a typological page, you'll be able to see dozens, um, if not hundreds, examples of, you know, that, that type. That's so fine for browsing, but what if you need bulk data for statistical analysis? Well, it just so happens that um, if you scroll down to the bottom, the very bottom of that page, um, this, um, what, what uh, Ethan has devised is a, an immediate statistical analysis of all the coins on that page, which will give you an average weight, an average um, axis, uh, average uh, dimension, and so forth. And then if you really want to dig into the data, there are ways to do that, which I'll, I'll show you, you know, a little bit later on. So. Um, it is, get it in tabular form? absolutely, you, you can download 
every bit of data you know on these <coughs> sites you know with a few clicks of the button you know into um, various spreadsheet forms or you know what what have you so, so before you and all the other museums started putting in <coughs> the, the price for examples you had to make a determination that yes we are going to refer to all these Macedonian coins by the price number right is that a decision that has to be made for you know every single discipline yes okay. yeah and and this you know, it, it just so happens that everybody working on Greek coins, for the most part, in these major collections are all friends. And so, you know, we, you know, had some friendly discussions and meetings and drank several bottles of wine and so forth and discussed how best <coughs> to do all this and, um, you know, made the decision that we were going to use price and price numbers initially for this. Now, uh, question. Yeah. What if uh, there's a coin that's not in price? That's what I was just going to get to. So um, those, you know, those of you who've worked on, worked with Price, know that you know s there's some problems with some of the attributions, and there are also coins um, that have appeared subsequently that are not in Price. And so the decision initially was to base all of this on Price, just simply because this would be the best way to launch this and to get it, you know, out there and get all this stuff linked up. So for Pella version one, this is essentially price, a digital version of price to, you know, uh, let, let's say a massively enhanced digital version of, of price. But for Pella version two, um, there is a committee now that is discussing, you know, how best to deal with, um, you know, the reattribution of some of this coinage or, you know, uh, material that is not in price. So ultimately what you will see happen is that there will be um, new, a new numbering system introduce this um, will no longer you know appear in Pella as say price four you know on, on the top of the page it will appear with its own Pella number uh, and there there will still be a concordance with all the price stuff so you can go in and search for material by a price number certainly and find that but you know ultimately we will be creating you know a new typology that will have um, individual Pella numbers now part of the problem is trying to come up with a numbering system that is infinitely expandable um, but also something which, you know, is stable enough that you can refer to it without, you know, every couple of years having that number sort of fall off or something. So um, we're, we're trying to work out, you know, how best to, you know, number this material. And this is, this is a problem not only for Pella, but also for, say, Ochre and for, um, you know, Seleucid coins online, ultimately, and Ptolemaic coins and so forth. So, you know, we'll, we'll need to work that out. And then another question. You're, you're cataloging public collections and the museums and universities. What about private collections? Yeah, and that's that, that's part part of the problem that we have with that is that um, all of what what the the way that these um, resources operate is through linked data. So if if that collection is not online in some linkable form, then we we can't link it. Um, so. One solution, you know, perhaps will be to offer, you know, a way, um, you know, say a, a parallel um, site of some sort where people can enter, you know, material that they have in their own collection that we can then link. So and for the um, a similar project that's running in Berlin, which is uh, called CMT for Thracian coinages, their um, private collectors actually regularly enter their databases, and when you go on it, they're online available with photos. Yeah. So um, ultimately, the idea is to um, allow that. It's the same problem with coin archives, and um, it is remarkable how many people um, for the Thracian side from Bulgaria. There is. I mean, you can see the collections listed, and it's a huge number of private collections. Some of them identified by name, and not others. It's an incredibly useful tool to view private collections, and the people have them. Not that they put them somewhere; they're just there. Then you have to deal with their misattribution. <laughs> no, they no. Get, it gets checked by, um, so you, and let's say you, you had a collection, it gets entered, and then um, our colleagues who run the project basically go and look at the photo it's and they referee, check each one. Right? Yeah, and they, they correct them. And no, the data is, I've looked at some of them, and there's, I've noticed one or two mistakes, but that's because, you know, they're not really mistakes, they're mi in interpretations. So it works extremely well. Yeah. Isn't the ultimate goal for this outside to be able to provide drop downs for population with correct spelling and everything else? Well, well yeah, I, 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 um, my ID concept doesn't yeah. allow you to put anything. You know, see, the spelling goes away with this. Yeah, with the ID concept. Yeah, yes. so yeah. that's, and yeah. it, it 
if you go, I all encourage you to look at that CNT, it's called. Um, it is, it's in English and German, and uh, it shows how private collectors can just, you know, enter so their material. So, so how do you get to that? Um, if you type in Corpus um, Numorum Tracticum or something like, it's under CNT, um, maybe Berlin or so, it, it's, it comes up relatively quickly. We can look at it maybe later, but yeah. Um, yeah. when Peter's finished. But yeah. So I just didn't want to, but the idea is, yes, that should be able to. No, and and th this is a problem um, that we're facing across the board, because one of the other resources that we have currently up is um, Art of Devastation, devoted to World War I medals, um, and a lot of the material uh, that I would like to include in Art of Devastation is, say, in auction catalogs or private collections or so forth. So it really, in order to enhance um, art of devastation. We need to find a solution to um, you know, putting you know this other material you know, or, or creating a way to link it into yeah. these sites. So you know th th this is something that we've been discussing and talking about, but we we don't yet have a a, uh, a solution for that. Um, so the, um, the the these sites, in addition to uh, of, um, assembling all of this material from different collections, uh, also. Uh, ultimately will provide uh, information on find spots for a lot of the material too because um, of course many of the coins that we have of Alexander the Great in our collection have come from various hordes um, and we want to be able to represent or present that information you know on these pages as well too so when you go to say the page for um, price four you'll be able to find um, what hordes and what find spots those coins of that type have, have appeared in. And um, in order to uh, organize all that information and to feed it into, um, you know, say the price for page, uh, we've um, started to develop a uh, another website called coinhoards.org, which is based on the inventory of Greek coin hoards that was published uh, in part by the ANS uh, back in 1973. And of course, subsequently, there's been the series Coin Hordes that Uta has um, edited along with um, Andy Meadows and others. Uh, that has been a continuation of that. That contains a wealth of data on thousands of hordes, you know, of Greek coin hordes that we, um, you know, would like to get um, digitized essentially, or um, uh, you know, in, in a way then that we can really begin to link that up now. Coinhoards.org is up and running, but um, it is at the moment just a, a very basic, um, uh, essentially, scan of IGCH. And um, you know, if you look on a page for um, you know this hoard, this this massive um, uh, Damanhur hoard that was dated by uh, Newell to 318 BC, rather precisely, you know, containing over 8,000 coins, um, you know, you, you can see that you know, it, on the left-hand side there, you you essentially get a digital version of what appears in print in in the volume. But um, you also then begin to see. Um, some of the mint locations, um, you know, from that hoard, you know, appearing in the map on uh, on the right hand side, and also the location where the the hoard was found uh, in red down here in Egypt. Now, ultimately, what we'd like to do with all of this and the plan, um, as part of this uh, Hellenistic Royal Coinages project, is to begin to atomize all of this data to, um, you know, create a big spreadsheet again for each and every one of these hordes, so that you can then say click on, you know, Alexander um, Amphipolis right here and find every example of that coin that has, you know, at least been registered for um, various hordes, um, um, or, you know, do a search, say, for Athenian obols to see what hordes Athenian obols and so forth have, have appeared in. So we, we've got a ways to go with coinhoards.org, but um, we hope that within, or we plan anyway, and we will, I'll say that, within the next couple of, we uh, couple of years have all of this um, set up and operating the way that we want it to, to be operating. Um, and also, as part of all of this, um, there there was an initiative <coughs> a, a few years ago with some money that uh, David Hill raised, and I think um, Ethan as well, to um, digitize a um, whole set of notebooks that Edward Newell had left behind, uh, which included a lot of detailed notes on many of these hordes. And um, each of these notebooks now has been scanned, but in addition to the scanning, um, they have been linked up. So if you go into um, you know, the individual um, notebooks, which I'll, I'll show you in just a second, you can click on 
um, uh, say a hoard uh, that will take you then to the coinhoards.org page for that or to an individual coin in the collection you know that Newell you know had mentioned or mentioned in the notebooks and so forth so you know ultimately then you know when you come in to use these resources there will be different ways um, and different categories of data that you can you know explore or um, reassemble or so forth for whatever your you know immediate um, you know research need is and one one cool thing about all of this which um, you know I, I mentioned a little bit earlier Bob I, I think you were asking about um, you know data analysis if you go into um, Pella for example right now and um, click a few buttons, you'll be able to do, say, a metrological analysis within seconds of every tetradram that is in Pella at the moment. You know, so you're, you're looking at, in, in this case, um, you know, I don't know, probably 12,000, 15,000, you know, tetradrams that you can, um, in this case, I, I just did an analysis of the weights from, you know, from uh, the end of the fourth century down to the first century BC and you know a number of scholars have noted over the years that there seems to have been a drop in the weight of the tetradram you know towards you know the end of the Hellenistic period this is something that Otto Morcom and others had commented on but here you have 12,000 coins that prove the point you know and you can see except for this bad British Museum data right here um, <laughs> that there is a you know that there are a handful of coins um, that, that have anomalous weights that we've been asking them to correct but um, <coughs> you know so so it doesn't look quite like that but you can see that there was in fact over the course of those centuries a drop in the weight of the tetradrams from you know roughly 17 grams down to 16 grams you know and where else are you going to be able to you know um, you know assemble 12,000 coins you know to be able to do that and to be able to do that in l literally a matter of seconds how many coins are in that outlier I, I, I dozens, but I, I yeah, yeah. yeah. enough that it, it pushes that out. So it's, um, but then um, you know again, uh, you know through uh, you know Nomisma right now. If you uh, go to the page for Alexander the Third, um, it is pulling in all of the information on all the hordes and all of the mints for Alexander the Third, and then minting or then uh, presenting all of this in, in a map, you know, a heat map even. Um, so you get, you know, an immediate overview of, you know, the coinage of Alexander the Great, you know, for these centuries. And, you know, then if you click on, say, the individual uh, mint or, you know, find spot right here, then you'll be obviously then be taken to that page uh, where you can, you know, explore further. But, you know, within, again, a matter of seconds, you, you can have a complete overview of a particular coinage or, you know, series of coinage. Um, and um, this really then begins to, you know, tell a picture that, um, you know, we, we've seen bits and pieces of in print over the years, but, you know, just hasn't quite been assembled in, in this in the same fashion. And here, you know, again, are the, are the notebooks that I mentioned, where, um, in this case, this page has been marked up with, um, you know, Aleppo, Pella, um, Amphipolis, and, you know, the various... Um, of countermarks or not, um, monograms and so forth um, that, that he discusses. And so if you click on this box around Amphipolis right there, it will then take you to um, you know, various pages associated <laughs> with that, you know, including coins, uh, you know, the, the mint page for that you know, on um, Nomisma, but then you know, also whatever other associated material we have. Yeah, well, I'm going to show that exact page. <coughs> right, yeah. So I'll, I'll leave that to, to David to, to explore. Now, um, I mentioned art of devastation, and um, one aspect of, of this that, that we've also um, you know, presented is um, these various subjects, which allows you then to, um, you know, say, be looking at a medal, in this case, a, a medal that was produced after the war that um, celebrated you know, the British participation in the war. Um, but there are various things that appear on the medal, including, you know, a Mark IV tank and a Lee Enfield rifle and mention of the Battle of Vimy Ridge and so forth. So we have um, set this up in such a way that if you then click, for example, on um, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, it then takes you to the Wikipedia page so you can read about what the Battle of Vimy Ridge was about. Or if you want to learn about the Lee Enfield rifle, it'll take you to the, the Wikipedia page for that as well, too. You so. should say, you always say we, it sounds as if there's a whole <laughs> team, but it's really Peter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's, you know, th a lot of people do, you know, participate in this and, and help out with all of that. So, um, one 
One other digital tool that we have in the works, which we're hoping to launch later this year, is um, a computer-aided dye study program. Um, this is something that Rick Wachonke um, spearheaded um, and initially funded with a, uh, a young Chinese programmer by the name of Wa Peng. And, um, we have been able to continue uh, Wa Peng's work on this through funding from uh, Joshua Ober at Stanford University. And so uh, we are um, getting very, very close to having a program that will allow you just to dump photos into the machine and have the machine do the you know, initial sorting and effectively do most of the heavy lifting for a dye study. And a lot of the coins that we've been throwing at it um, in recent years have been um, these notorious Athen uh, Athenian owls, notorious because they're very difficult to do a die study of because there, were, you know, there are tens of thousands of these coins existing today. Um, and uh, it, it will just ruin anybody's career or eyesight trying to do that. In fact, the largest Greek die study to date was Wolfgang Fischer Bozert's um, study of the diagrams of Tarentum. And there were, I think, roughly 8,000 coins that took him the better part of a decade to study. And I, I've estimated that there's 60 to 70,000 extant Athenian owls from the late fifth century. So, you know, you're looking at half a century of work for somebody to do a die study of this material alone. Um, and this program potentially could do it, you know, in a matter of weeks, if, if not um, sooner, if all the material can be assembled. So ultimately, we are getting to a point where you can sit, you know, in your pajamas with a cup of, cup of coffee in the morning and start to knock out die studies, you know, by um, going into a Pella page and throwing all that material into this CADS program and having it churn out, um, you know, the material, the links, uh, then uh, go to coinhoards.org, get all the die uh, or all the, um, the, the fine spot information, and then say go to the Newell notebooks and see whatever Newell said about that, as well as going then into the various publications um, or other digital resources, and you know within a matter of hours be able to produce a study that you know previously would have taken you know weeks, if not months, if not years. So this is where we're going. I mean, the speed of research, you know, that you know is potentially on the table here is you know really phenomenal. But to get to that point, we still need to you know do a lot of this back end work. You know, sitting around this table in particular, working out these definitions and creating these spreadsheets. So um, I just want to uh, very quickly um, just demo uh, some of the stuff by going to the site. Um, and uh, while I'm trying to get all this hooked up, if there's any questions that anybody has, I'd be happy to, uh, to answer that. Well, for CADS, exactly what is the input? You say it's photos? Yeah. A photo of, of a coin? Yeah. And then behind the scenes, it's got photos of all the ones that are already known? Well, it, I, I, the, the way that the algorithm works is well beyond um, my math skills and my ability to explain it. So um, I, I can't exactly explain how this works, but it essentially will take um, a pair of photos and try to find matches and then constantly be shuffling through you know, all the various photos looking for you know, matches and points and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I, I have stressed you know, with Wapeng is that in the real world, all of these photos are going to be coming from a number of different sources. Some are going to be high quality, some are not. So the algorithm has to be able to deal with photos of various sizes and various qualities and, and so forth. But essentially what it does is that it gives you a, um, a range of probability that you know, this and this are a match. And so, um, you know, if it says that it's a 90% probability that they're a match, then, you know, the ones that it has, you know, given a high probability have actually turned out to be matches. Um, you know, if it's a low probability, then, you know, there's very likely not a match. So there still is work that, you know, a specialist has to do to be able to look, you know, to look at all of this and d decide whether or not the machine was right. But, you know, again, the machine will do a lot of this heavy lifting. You know, I mean, the way that I've traditionally done dye studies is to put these photos onto a three by five card and, you know, that takes, you know, days or weeks to, you know, assemble all that. And then, you know, sit at my coffee table until late at night, you know, with my eyes going cross, you know, trying to find, you know, this and spreading this out on a table and so forth. So, you know, that type of work is, you know, what the, um, the machine will be able to handle. And uh, that, that is, you know, what really is uh, one of the more time-consuming aspects of these dye studies. 
<coughs> so uh, first, let, let me, uh, yeah. Is it anticipated going forward that the department structure will be retained? We'll see. I mean, if, if it's something that, that continues to be, you know, beneficial. I mean, you know, at, at the moment it is useful um, to be able to at least make that initial cut between, say, looking for a Greek coin or a Roman coin. Um, you know, ultimately it might not be as, as useful, but, you know, at the moment it certainly is, I think. Are these URIs replicated or localized so that when you submit a query, it doesn't send out a million requests for each little ID to each table? Uh, in, in would be immense. Yeah, in, in which, um, what, what part of all of this are you talking about? Well, you send out a query that has fields that are normalized to IDs. Each one is a separate resource somewhere. Your HTML is going to send out a separate request to each of these tables. Right. I mean, uh, I'm that's insane. Yeah, it, it, no. yeah I, I don't think it works that way, but I, you know, again, don't have the technical ability to, you know, answer the question. So, um, you know, again, when, when, when you go into uh, Mantis, uh, as, as I have here, and then clicked on the Greek departments, uh, you can do a keyword search, um, you know, so if you want to search Owl or Athens or something of the sort, you know, just right off the bat, you can do that. Or if you want to try to narrow down the search, you can then begin to click on, say, region, and then scroll down, uh, you know, the list here, or uh, start to type, you know, something like um, Attica or something in there um, to find the term that you're looking for, um, or denomination or material, um, portrait deity, and so forth. And then um, you can also enter a date range, um, either AD or um, BC, again to you know try to narrow this down. Now. Um, once you have narrowed all of this down, um, in fact, let's just do um, a search for, um, let's just say Sardis. Um, uh, and, and here you, you can see part of the problem. We have things like perhaps Sardis or perhaps Smyrna or perhaps Sardis, and th these are problems you know, in the database that we need to ultimately take care of. Um, and then, uh, you know, authority, if you um, say Alexander III there, um, and if you want to search for coins in the database that have images, then you do need to click on this little button over here that says have images down in the lower, you know, right-hand corner. Um, th there is no um, automatic return, um, you know, function. So you do have to then click on this button that says refine search. And this is the, what then will initiate the search. And so once you do it, it'll take a few seconds um, and then find all of the coins uh, that um, at the moment, you know, have photographs and, you know, are, you know, within those parameters. And then if you click on that particular record, it will then, you know, bring up, you know, the typological description and the administrative history and so forth. Now, um, since this is a, um, uh, for some reason, this isn't linked to Pella, which is um, not good. <laughs> Something that we've got to fix. But um, uh, but then um, when you go to um, just go to Pella here. working a little slowly today. Do you know where Mantis, the name came from? Is that an acronym or does it mean no, we Latin? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you'll, you'll notice that each of our, our databases have um, different Donum. names of, of some sort or another. Donum, um, Donum. Donum was the first. So I, I did read the, the Mantis one. The idea is, you know, this was a sort of weird names were given and then Donum was the first one where we saw Donum meaning gift. Mm. Yeah, don't worry, yeah. So then, yeah. of course, then it was that was the first one. Then it was like this challenge, but it was also data a database of numismatic, so database of mm. num. You know, mm. don't yeah. Mm. So it had to be, uh, um, you know, mean something, mm -hmm. and the word itself ideally do something. And we would have internal competitions, actually external, <laughs> mantis mm. being the Greek for the seer, you know, the uh -huh, person yeah, I can yeah, see. Yeah. But uh -huh. it also means. 
Yeah. What does it mean? It means uh, um, it, it has again a name. But it's yeah. Orient. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's a button and you pray. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then Archer, Archer, we gave up for, for this because that's just Archer hunting. Well, it was for archives because A R A R C H archives. Right. But also Research. for you know reference tool. So yeah, but it's not but a Archer. Archer is our great benefactor. Archer hunting. This is just something we do, you know, but then people begin to refer to it at yeah. the beginning saying nobody's ever going to call it a database because we didn't call it Mantis and then it develops. Yeah, and, and in fact, um, <laughs> a, a, the, um, the, these, these uh, title, um, uh, I'm not sure what, banners, banners, that's what they're called. These, these um, are, are the work of uh, Alan Roche. Um, at the back of, of the room there are um, in-house photographer and um, designer and he's he's done uh, some some really great banner work for a lot of this but um, like crow for example and again uh, just to show you where this is located so if you go to research on the page and then click online resources you'll then find you know the list of all the various uh, online resources that we have um, and you'll see this banner that Alan created for coins of the Roman Republic online with the uh, you know the um, acronym crow so came up with this really clever you know, banner for that as well, too. Um, so if, if you go into Pella, and um, all of these resources are built on the same Numi's share platform that Ethan Gruber has developed. And so all of the platforms work essentially the same way. Um, you know, whether you're looking at Pella or Art of Devastation or Oak or what have you, um, they're all essentially laid out the same way and they all function the same way. So once you're familiar with one, you, you can you know, easily work on one or the other. But, you know, again, I, I mentioned the language um, function. So if you go to the far right hand side of, of that bar, you can then s uh, choose your language. Right now for uh, Pella, we have three languages, uh, but for Ochre, as I mentioned, I think we have at least a dozen different languages. You know, so if you click on that, it will then you know, switch uh, the language preference you know, to uh, German, and then you know, all of the um, you know, descriptions and so forth uh, you know, throughout the site then are in German rather than English. Um, you know, so, and then you, you notice along the top here as well, you know, we now have Sprache rather than, you know, language, so, um, you know, to switch back, then um, you, you click to, uh, you know, English and go from there. Now, to get into the site, then you just click on Browse um, to get beyond the title page here, and then um, it's working awfully slowly today. <coughs> But um, once, once we're in to the browse function, um, it, it'll give you a list then of all the price numbers, starting with you know, price number one you know, through price 4,233 or whatever it is. And so you can then click on that price number to take you to the typological page for that individual coin, coin type. And you know, again, it will give you all the examples below it. But I, I just want to show you, um, as soon as it, it links up, um, the, uh, the way to extract the data you know, from, you know, from the page. So you'll notice in, in the upper right or left-hand corner right here, the data options. And this gives you uh, a whole array of, of different data options um, in different formats that you can um, download for whatever you know, your purposes are. Um, so, you know, all of this data that, that's in the site or, you know, for, you know, say price four, if we, you know, scroll down here, um, is available for download, um, you know, in tabular or other forms. Um, so you can then, you know, begin to use it um, however you want. And, and again, you can see up in the upper right-hand uh, corner there, too, there's uh, various ways to export it, you know, too. But um, when I, um, you know, I, I mentioned that if you scroll to the very bottom of the page, you'll find um, the the immediate uh, quantitative analysis, and this gives you the overall um, averages for axis. You know, this is an average of um, you know one to twelve, you know, hours of the clock. So um, it's six point seven five for type four or price four. Um, they have an average diameter of 24.8 millimeters and an average weight of 16.95 grams. You know, and that, that is taking all of the um, 
you know, the 60 some odd examples of material that, um, you know, the types that, that are represented on this page from the British Museum, the Ashmolean, ANS, Bibliothèque Nationale in France, and so forth. How are you standardizing the diameters? A lot of these plans are oval or odd. Yeah, and that's, th that, that's a problem because every institution has its own um, way of dealing with that. And, um, and closing circles. Yeah, and in fact, you know, th this has become a problem with our recent discussions about standardizing the shape field in our, our um, in-house database because, you know, a lot of the ancient coins were hand-struck, which means that they're not exactly round. So, you know, in, these, in this case, do we call them round or do we call them sort of round dish or, you know, what, yeah, uh, you know, how do we standardize that or do we just leave that field blank for, you know, ancient coinage because um, it really doesn't mean anything. You're not, who, who is going to go into a database looking for, say, round ancient coins? <laughs> um, people might go into the database looking for oval ancient coins because a lot of them are, you know, say, oblong or oval. So if that's the case, then, you know, how do we deal with that? Um, so, and, and then again, here is the, the map uh, that, that shows, um, you know, what, what is going on with uh, that. So it shows you where the um, coin was struck. And at the moment, we don't have any uh, hoard information associated with that type. Uh, I'd also just want to show you show you coin hoards um, quickly. Um, here, if you click on browse IDs and enter, I, th I think denim hoard was. Um, oops. And click on that. Yep. Um, what? Yeah, so here again, it lists, um, it, it gives you a, a digitized version, but not a full, fully enhanced digital version of what appears on the page in IGCH. And it also then um, gives you a map, which is taking its own sweet time to load right there of um, fine spots, or, you know, the fine spot for the hoard in Egypt and then various myths associated with it. But then if you scroll to the bottom of the page, you get various associated content, which includes um, uh, Newell notebooks, uh, mentions, and um, you know, publications and so forth. And this is something that David will um, explain a little bit more a little bit later on. So uh, that's, that's about what I've got to say uh, um, uh, about this material. And if there's any further questions, I'll be happy to answer them or um, show you, you know, some more demonstrations.